So we are here with Pat from the amazing, incredible, high energy smithereens. I just caught your set and wow, you guys were amazing. Well, I wish you could have seen a set where we were playing on our own equipment through a good PA. Um, I'm glad you liked it. Well, I mean, the, the energy was off the charts. I really loved it. Yeah. Do, you, do you guys consider yourself a garage band at heart, would you say? Yeah, and we, we work very hard to preserve that. We've been together for uh, over 30 years. 30 and a half years, and uh, if you notice, we plug directly into the amplifiers. So there's no effects. So, yeah, I, I, I feel proud if, if you, you consider us to be a garage band. And I have a question, what does it take to keep a band together for 30 years? Well, a lot of respect and a lot of, um, how can I put it, we have to adapt to each other's ways and also adapt to the changes that one goes through through the course of one's life. Everybody's a lot different now than when we started. Um, we started the band when I was 24. And, you know, it evolves and, and you kind of adapt to it. I'm amazed that we survived uh, in the initial period of the band. It was six years of no success whatsoever. Most bands would never make it that far. And uh, it's difficult to get uh, four people in one room to agree upon any one topic, much less get them living on a bus together for 10 years. So uh, my ex-wife used to joke with me and she would say, what's it like being married to four people, meaning her <laughs> and the other three guys in the band. And uh, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, the, the band survived the marriage. So. <laughs> that's a, that's yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah. Now, any... Any war stories on the road that come to mind that you guys didn't survive as a band that really solidified that yeah? Well, the very first gig that we did uh, before we went on tour with the Ramones, the Ramones, the first gig we did as a touring band was opening for ZZ Top, and it was in Williamsburg, Virginia on 4th of July of 1986, and it was a sold-out arena show, there were 20,000 people, and we thought, wow, this is going to be tremendous. And we had worked for so long, we finally had a good agency. They were called Premier Talent. They had U2, Bon Jovi. This is 1986. The Ramones, The Talking Heads, Judas Priest, The Rhythmics, U2, Springsteen, The Who. They had everybody. So we didn't want to let them down. Anyway, about five minutes before showtime in this packed auditorium, opening for ZZ Top, the promoter told the sold-out drunken crowd on 4th of July of 1986 that the opening act Ted Nugent had canceled oh, no. and that the Smithereens were taking its place and we had a hit with Blood and Roses but that audience did not know who we were so the second we took the stage we were just assaulted non-stop with full cups of beer knives, M80s firecrackers, cherry bombs <laughs> shoes, brassiers everything I was totally drenched, and uh, it was uh, a testament to the solidarity of the band and the, uh, you know, the the sheer intent of or resolve rather that we were never going to let anyone force us off the stage that we had we had earned our place, and so it was that moment that we knew we could survive just about anything. I mean, they really were trying to hurt us, and. Uh, after the set, we went out and we found out who some of the culprits were. We just, yeah, we, we did, <laughs> okay. we did actually. Back then, you know, people just just it's didn't so sue at random. Yeah. You know, so. um, I want to talk to you about your uh, Beatles covers. Yeah. Now, what? I mean, other than the fact that the Beatles are, you know, why why did Austin, why did we do it? Do it? Um, we hadn't put out an album in a long time and. The industry had changed, and while all of the shows continued to sell out, um, a lot of our audience, the record buying public, a lot of them had grown up with us, got married, had children, jobs, mortgages, and were less active. Instead of buying a record a week, they'd buy like one a month or something. So I came up with something I felt would uh, be the ideal project to reintroduce the band to the, to the world. Um, and it wasn't necessarily a new original album. I had done 
a, a few solo albums in the meantime. So it wasn't as though I wasn't releasing new compositions. I just felt that um, the odds of shining a light on the band would be increased dramatically by uh, attempting something that would be considered impossible by, by most, which was to do a note-for-note -note recreation of a very important album in the history of pop music, um, Meet the Beatles, which was released in January of 1964. And I remember uh, I was eight years old at the time, and it, it changed my world. It also changed the world irrevocably, because within a month of that album being released, there was a garage band on every block in every small town in America. So there was a historical value to it. Plus, I came across a magazine, um, and the topic was 1964, the year everything changed. And it talked about the Vietnam War. It talked about Lyndon Johnson uh, taking over for Kennedy and um, the great society that he sought to create. Um, Excuse me. So it talked about that whole era, but mainly it talked about the impact or the profound impact of Beatlemania and the release of Meet the Smithereens. So what we did was recreate the whole album. It's done note for note, but in our style. And I'm not trying to sing like McCartney or Lennon. Uh, I sing it the way I sing it. And it's our guitar tones, uh, and it, it put us um, on the front page of the Arts and Leisure section of the New York Times, and uh, that's, you know, it's really uh, an interesting album. People love the record, you know, and um, they love our take on it. We kind of energize the board of them today. But there's no way you can improve on the arrangements. We approached it like a classical orchestra playing Beethoven or Mozart. You play the notes as written, but if you have any style of your own or character of your own as a musician, it will sound like you. Talk about changes in the industry that you've gone through. Obviously, the industry has changed tremendously from five years ago, ten years ago. How do you feel about the internet and you know, the way things are being done now? Well, it's a mixed blessing. Uh, the internet is great because it lets people connect with each other and they can discuss the band. It lets us do a very powerful outreach to let people know what we're doing. It's great on that level, and you can't really have a career without it anymore. Um, certainly hard copy CDs as we know it will ultimately be a thing of the past, at least at retail. Um, I, I, I saw this come in a long time ago. In fact, the Beatles record, it broke a record on iTunes. So it was, I think, uh, it had more downloads than hard copy sales. It was the first record to do this. It broke some kind of iTunes record, but anyway. Um, the problem I have is with bit torrenting sites. You know, I'll send review copies out of something, and someone who's reviewing it might not like the band, or they'll pass on them, they'll put it on eBay. Somebody will buy it months before the release, they'll put it on a bit torrent site, and it's history. Uh, Tom Petty did something that's interesting, and it could be also destructive. Uh, if you go to his website, I think he's in the middle of a tour. He said, buy a ticket for, I think, I know I read this on the website, buy a ticket to the concert and you get a free download of the album. It's, you know, he can afford to do that, but nobody else can. There are very few people who are in that position. What I fear is that future generations of musicians will realize, uh, you know, very quickly that they're not going to make money. They'll only make money from live gigs if they do it, but they won't make money from selling records because people are just sharing, uh, they call it file sharing, but it's really, you know. What about merchandising and vinyl? Well, I mean, I, I love vinyl. We have vinyl here, you know. Do you feel that that could help bridge the gap or not? No, I, I, I think that people need to get paid for their work, yeah. you know. And that's an incentive for uh, for creating, you know. What is the incentive for a young artist to create if they're going to be in the poorhouse their whole life? They'll leave that behind and they'll get a legitimate job. So that's, that's the problem. And the fans don't realize what they're doing when they are... Uh, 
they're passing around intellectual property that doesn't belong to them. It'd be like, you know, if you worked in a bank or you worked at a job and you got paid every two weeks by direct deposit, <laughs> and you worked 12 hours a day and the money never came, yeah. came to your account. So. Um, is there anything or anybody at Rockcom that you're very excited about that you want to see, anyone in particular you want to meet? Um, I met Fang. Um, Fang's pretty cool. From uh, <laughs> Core Review on the Raiders. Uh, Clay Cole had a great show in New York uh, when I was a child, uh, and I watched his show religiously every Saturday on WPIX Channel 11. And it was a rock and roll sort of variety show where the kids would see them dance on the show. And he had the Rolling Stones live in 1964 on his show. And he was a, a childhood hero of mine. He's here and I met him. I actually interviewed him. Oh, very good. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of folks here that that are very. I, I want to meet Johnny Winter, but I don't know that I'll get access to see him. You know? <laughs> He's here somewhere. Uh, she get access. You guys have a smithereen. Well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I well, thank you so much for You're taking welcome. time, and uh, enjoy the rest of your rock on. I will. Right. See ya. Yeah.